I'll take a minute to thank Dr. Aiken and the administration here at Southeastern for giving me this opportunity to share this lecture this morning. The title of my lecture, as Dr. Pace mentioned, is Victory Through Suffering, the true meaning of Philippians 4.13. Nobody likes to lose. Winning is fun. Losing is hard. And at the end of a competition, we want to be the ones singing that we are the champions. You know the song. No time for losers, because we are the champions of the world. And in the midst of a challenging feat, we might wonder if it's appropriate to claim Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. After all, we want to believe God's word, and it states that we can do all things through the strength we receive from Jesus. So if it says we can do all things, then certainly we can do all things, can't we? Well, it's only 10 or 11 words in English, six words in Greek, panta iskuo ento in dunamunti me. I can do all things through Christ or the one who strengthens me. And yet these words have motivated millions of Christians. In fact, after John 3.16, Philippians 4.13 is often the most searched verse in the Bible. As you're probably well, we're well, we're well aware, Philippians 4.13 is often linked with famous athletes. Some of you may recall Tim Tebow with the 4.13 black strips under his eyes, it was featured on several covers of Sports Illustrated. Steph Curry's signature shoes with Under Armour placed a 413 at the bottom of the tongue, and inside the tongue or at the heel counter, it states, I can do all things. Curry explains, he says, it's a mantra that I live by and something that drives me every single day. It'll hopefully inspire people to find something that drives them, whether that's a verse or some other motivating force that keeps you hungry and keeps you driven. But as Curry's quote reveals, this verse is also one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible. It is my contention that the way that most people understand and apply this verse, that we can do anything through Christ's strength, misses the real meaning of the verse. This verse does not refer to what we accomplish, winning a sporting event, climbing a mountain, getting an A on an exam. You see, at its core, this verse is not about what we do at all, but it's about what is done or what happens to us. Paul is encouraging us to victory, yes, but the victory is primarily one of defense not one of offense. The underlying question is, how do you respond when you face challenges or hardships in life? Do you have victory in such circumstances? Can you have victory in suffering? And so this lecture will carefully examine Philippians 4.13. Well, first, I want to discuss the historical and literary context. Second, I will explain the meaning of our victory, the means of our victory, and the message of our victory. And then finally, I will offer some personal examples of how this verse has been meaningful to my life during difficult circumstances. So first, the context of Philippians 4.13. Context is king, or at least it should be. When something is taken out of context, it can be used in a manner for which it was never intended. Indeed, it can be used to mean just the opposite of what was intended. Taking a statement out of context is unhelpful and wrong. It is like ripping a child from the arms of her mother. Picture that. Who would do such a thing? And yet, this seems that this practice occurs far too often. Words derive their meaning from the literary context. Janine Brown comments, the, 
quote, the method of reading select passages here and there, which is rather common in the Christian tradition, can lead to misreading if the literary context is ignored. Moises Silva illustrates the absurdity of, attempt, of attempting to read a passage in a letter without knowledge of the whole letter. He states, what would one think of a man who receives a five-page letter from his fiancée on Monday and decides to read only the third page on that day, the last page on Thursday, and the first page two weeks later, and so on? We are all aware of the fact that reading a letter in such a piecemeal fashion would likely create nothing but confusion. And so Duvall and Hayes maintain that, quote, the most important principle in biblical interpretation is that context determines meaning. But what happens when context is not king? What happens when context is dethroned? You know, as I read the Bible, I often think of how easy it would be to take verses out of context. You ever thought about that? I'm not, I'm not, not recommending it. But here are some examples of taking a verse out of context. Again, I am not recommending these interpretations. Do not tweet these, okay? But I've often thought that Revelation 11.10 would make a great verse for Christmas. You can picture it on the Hallmark card. You open it up. It states, And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents. There it is. Biblical basis for gifts. But the reason that this verse should never be used in connection with Christmas relates to its context. The verse is not talking about Christians celebrating the birth of their Savior, but it's about the celebration of God's enemies who kill his prophets over their apparent victory. You see, to apply this text to Christmas is akin, as I said, to ripping a child from the arms of her mother. Or perhaps someone might think that Psalm 79.1 would make a great missions text. It says, O oh God, the nations have come into your inheritance. Well, this, this sounds like the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12.3, that Abraham would be a blessing to the nations and that the nations would come into Israel and receive the blessings. But this text doesn't mean that. You can't use this text that way. The full verse reads, O oh God, the nations have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. You see, those who came into the inheritance were God's enemies who were, would be judged for their despicable acts. Or suppose someone would use Ecclesiastes 10.2 to argue that Christians should vote Republican because it says a wise man heart uh, inclines to the right, but a fool's heart inclines to the left. Of course Solomon wasn't thinking about the American political system of the right and left. You should have more respect for the Bible than to use the Bible in such a way. You see, in such a case, context is dethroned from its kingship. But I, I do often think, and this one may be more appropriate, I don't know, I'm thinking about this one. But 1 Corinthians 15, 51, I'm thinking about above the nursery, the church nursery, where it says, have you ever worked in the nursery? We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. It's perfect. The problem is that in 1 Corinthians 15, it has nothing to do with newborns and sleeping. The passage is found in the context of Paul's discussion about the resurrection, and the reference to those who sleep is it's a euphemism for death. He's saying that not all will die before the Lord's return, but all will be changed. That is, they will receive a glorified body fit for eternal life. One last example. One night, a few years back, my wife was reading a devotional in bed, and for some reason I grabbed it and I was flipping through it. And I noticed that one of the devotions was based on Genesis 2-7, which states, 
And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now, the point being emphasized was that just as God breathed into Adam the breath of life, so too you would do well to take a breather. At that point, I almost fell out of bed. What is going on here? It may be true that every once in a while you should take a breather, but do not quote Genesis 2-7 as a defense for that. That is not what the text is talking about. So what is the context of Philippians 4-13? Well, the historical context is this. Paul is in prison, probably in Rome, during the reign of Nero. Paul had established the church at Philippi, according to Acts 16, on his second missionary journey. He had visited the church at least three times before writing this letter to them. And so when he writes this letter, he is in prison under house arrest, awaiting trial before the Roman emperor. From AD 60 to 62, nearly 30 years after his conversion, Paul waited for the opportunity to plead his case before Emperor Nero himself. And as he writes this letter to the Philippians, he recognizes that death may be the outcome of his imprisonment. You see, as a prisoner of Rome, the most powerful nation in the world, Paul was well aware that his life was on the line. You see, the Emperor Nero was known to be hostile to Christians. Indeed, in July AD 64, a couple years later, Christians were blamed for a fire that destroyed Rome. And the Roman historian Tacitus writes this. He says, but all the human efforts, all the lavish gifts of the emperor, all the propitiations of the gods did not banish the sinister belief that the fire was the result of an order, an order by Nero himself. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and afflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians or Christians by the populace. An immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crimes of setting the city on fire as of hatred against mankind. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with the skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as nightly illumination when daylight had expired. So although this particular scenario occurred a few years after Paul was in prison, it demonstrates the type of emperor that Nero was. And so Paul lived under this reality and the burden that death may be the outcome of his imprisonment. But it is precisely in this context that Paul states that he has learned the secret of being content. He realized that contentment was not related to his environment or his circumstances. You see, our circumstances are continually changing, but God never changes. And so Paul was at peace with his circumstances. He didn't put his hope in his circumstances, but on God. And therefore, Paul did not let his dire circumstances prevent him from serving others and even having a joyful attitude, which, of course, is one of the themes of Philippians, right? It says that Paul, he prayed with joy for the Philippians in 1.4. He rejoiced that the gospel was being preached even, to the, even with those who had wrong motives in 1.18. He rejoiced to be suffering for others, even if it meant his own death for the sake of Christ, 2.17. He rejoiced greatly in the Lord that the Philippians were concerned for him, 4.10. You see, the fact that Paul was able to rejoice while in prison is nothing short of miraculous. It was miraculous because it came from a supernatural ability, an ability given to him by the Holy Spirit. Paul was a missionary, and missionaries were not supposed to be in prison. They were supposed to be out freely sharing the gospel. And yet, Paul was chained to a Roman soldier, not free to travel. 
but trusting in God's sovereignty, he joyfully made the most of his situation. He didn't become preoccupied with his problems, but instead he was concerned for the Philippian Christians and even took the time to write to them a letter. You see, it's in this context that Paul states he learned the secret of contentment. He was a Roman prisoner, faced the possibility of execution, and yet was still able to be concerned for others and even rejoice. So what is the precise meaning of our passage then, Philippians 4.13? What does Paul mean when he says that he can do all things through Christ? So let's now consider this passage in detail. So the meaning of our victory. What does Paul mean when he says, I can do all things? Was he exaggerating? Was he using the power of positive words? Was he engaging in wishful thinking? Or perhaps does he mean something different than what we might think? And so let's look at this phrase word by word. First, what does Paul mean when he states that he can do all things? The verb here is the Greek verb is skuo. It means to be strong, to be powerful, able to prevail over. Let me give you just a few examples of where this verse is used elsewhere in the New Testament. In Acts 19.16, a demon-possessed man, it says, prevailed over, there's the verb, the seven sons of Sceva. A few verses later, we read, the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. And in John's vision, in Revelation, he informs us that Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and that the dragon fought back but could not prevail over them. And so although this verb is skuo, is, is translated can do in Philippians 4.13, the verb is used 27 other times in the New Testament, and it is never translated can do anywhere else. It is translated to be able, which is very similar to can do. If you can do something, you're able to do it. It is translated that way 20 times, but in that context, it is completed by another verb. For example, Jesus tells his disciples, were you not able to keep watch? That's a complementary infinitive, if those of you studied Greek, able to keep watch. But here there is no, there is no other verb. It stands by itself. And so it is unlikely that it should be best translated can do or able in this context. And so from these and other examples, it is clear that Paul is not so much talking about what he can do, but about prevailing or having the victory over something. That is, he is not claiming he can do all things through Christ, but rather he can prevail or have the victory over any circumstance he's in by relying on Christ's strength. When trials and suffering wage war and fight against us, through Christ's strength, we can prevail. Indeed, the strength that God provides, through his strength, we are victorious. And so what Paul is saying is not that he can do all things, but rather that he can prevail, have the victory over any circumstance by relying on Christ and his strength. Second, what does he mean when he says all things? Certainly this cannot mean that he can do anything through Christ's power so that the meaning is unrestricted in any way. Indeed, the preceding verses clarify Paul's statement, right? Going back to the context. What does he mean? Well, what does the context tell us? And so in verses 11 and 12, he declares that he learned the secret of being content in any circumstance that he was in. Verse 11 reads, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. You see, the key here is found in verse 12. 
when he states, in any and every circumstance. Indeed, the word any, panti, Greek, and every, pasin, are derivatives from the same word, pas, which is the same word, again, found in the translation of all things. These all come from the same Greek word. So in Greek, it all ties together. And so the all things of verse 13 refers back to any and every circumstance that he's in. When Paul writes all things, he's specifically referring to all those situations, all those circumstances that he faced, some of them good and some of them very difficult. He states that he learned to be content in any situation. He knew how to be content with much, and so he uses the words abound, plenty, abundance. And he knew how to be content with little, brought low, hunger, need. The NIV, the updated 2011 version, helped correct the misunderstanding of this verse when it translated the 84 version read, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. The updated version reads, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. You see, the phrase all this drives the reader back to the previous context and say, all, to say all what? The contemporary English Bible is perhaps even better. It reads, I can endure all these things through the power of the one who gives me strength. In their lexicon, Lawanida paraphrased the verse as follows. I am able to face all conditions by the one who makes me able to do it. John Calvin comments, when he says all things, he means merely all those things which belong to his calling. And if you know the calling of Paul, it was one that involved suffering. And so many modern commentators have sought to correct misunderstandings and abuses of our text. For example, Gerald Hawthorne notes, quote, the translations which give us the impression that Paul meant that he can do anything and that nothing was beyond his powers are misleading to the point of being false. Panta, all things, as used here, can refer only to all those situations, both good and bad, that have just been described. Walter Hansen likewise comments, any use of this verse to support a claim or a goal of a triumphant, victorious Christian life without weaknesses or limitations conflicts with the immediate context and the wider teaching of Paul. But how? How, how was Paul able to be content in whatever situation he was in? How was he able to do that? What was the means of his victory? And what we see here is that the means of his victory was his union with Christ. He says it's through Christ or through the one who strengthens me. Notice that Paul's strength didn't come from, Paul, Paul's victory didn't come from his own strength. At first it might seem that way. It might seem that Paul's being rather self-sufficient here. If you, if you read this, all the times he uses the word I, I have learned in whatever situation, I am to be, content, uh, to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things. But the secret that Paul had is this. His secret was that he didn't do it, Christ did it through him. And therefore, it's a secret that's available to all believers. Again, to quote Hawthorne, he says, the secret of Paul's independence was his dependence upon another. His self-sufficiency in reality came from being in vital union with one who is all-sufficient. Jesus told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul states in 2 Corinthians, for the sake of Christ then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. 
For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, Paul's victory over his circumstances came through his union with Christ. You see, the Greek text indicates that it's not merely through Christ, but it's in Christ, en to and dunamunti me. That is, the idea is not merely that Paul's ability to handle various situations came through Christ, as if Christ was the agent passing him a power bar, but rather it was through his union with Christ. It was because he was in Christ. John Murray wrote that, quote, union with Christ is the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation. It is not simply a phase of the application of redemption. It underlies every aspect of redemption. Indeed, it underlies our ability to be content in whatever situation we find ourselves. What does it mean to be in Christ? What does it mean to be united to Christ? It means by faith we put, place our faith in him. It means that we died with him and that we were raised with him to newness of life. It means that every spiritual blessing now is ours because of our relationship with him. But it also means that Christ is in us through this union. Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Wayne, Wayne Grudem reminds us, saying, to overlook this truth would be to neglect the source of spiritual strength that we have within us. And so the apostle John writes, he who is in you, in you is greater than he who is in the world. The Spirit of Christ dwells in believers and empowers us to be victorious, even in the midst of trials. And we're also encouraged to persevere in trials through Christ's example. He is the one who is faithful and tr entrusted himself completely to his Father. He is the one who endured 40 days and 40 nights of temptation. He is the one who perfectly obeyed the will of the Father, include, including drinking the cup of his wrath. He is the one who turned the other cheek and prayed for his enemies. And he is the one who humbled himself even to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so we are united to the one who defeated sin, who conquered death and the grave, and who is now the sovereign Lord over heaven and earth. You see, through Christ's example, we are encouraged to abide in him and to receive strength from the union we have with him. And so Paul's victory came through Christ's ongoing work of empowering him. It was ongoing. The, the word here, the, it's an active participle, endunamunti, and it's used substantively. You probably have no idea what I'm talking about, some of you, but it's okay. It means the one who strengthens. For those of you in my Greek class, this will be extra credit, okay? But it, it's, the, it's a participle, and it's, the present, it's a uh, present tense form, imperfective aspect, we might say. And so it depicts the action as ongoing, not as complete, and therefore it indicates that Paul is not referring to a one-time event. I like the way that Matthew Henry paraphrases the verse. He says, it's through Christ who is strengthening me and does continually strengthen me. It is by his constant and renewed strength that I am enabled to act in everything. I wholly depend on him for all my spiritual power. So Paul had to constantly rely on Christ. You see, if we're not continually communing with God, in word, in his word, in prayer, then we're depleting the source of our strength. It doesn't come from ourselves. It comes from our union with Christ. And so this verse can be translated or paraphrased. Here's my, here's my paraphrase of the verse. Here's what I think Paul is saying. I can have the victory or prevail over any circumstance, any situation through my union with Christ who continually strengthens me. 
Now, what difference does this make? What is the message of our victory? Let me give you four reasons why I think this text matters, understanding it this way. First, it has broad application. It relates to everyone. When understood this way, it becomes very, a very powerful and significant verse. I think one that is actually more meaningful and more helpful to a believer. You see, it's not primarily about our great accomplishments that we attempt. It's not about winning a sporting event. It's not about achieving the victory of that next milestone in our lives. That's far too narrow a perspective. It would only apply to us in a few circumstances when we decide to really step out in faith and claim this verse. But rather, this verse relates to us here and now. All of us are in a difficult, faith-testing, and overwhelming circumstance. And if we're not now, we will be. Maybe you or a family member have health issues, physical limitations, surgery, cancer, depression, aging parents. Maybe you're facing difficulties at work or difficulties finding a job. Difficulties with, with relationships, maybe a child, maybe a parent, maybe a spouse, a separation, a divorce in the family. Maybe there's financial stress. You see, it's in those situations that this verse speaks to us. Not when we decide to really do something for the Lord, it's every day of our lives. We rely on his strength in whatever situation we find ourselves in. But secondly, this message is humbling. It's humbling because it reminds us that we're not in control. I think we like the idea that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, whatever, of course, through the strength that God provides, but it's when we decide, what we decide, and if we decide, it puts all the responsibility on us. All the initiative is on us. But this verse reminds us that we're not the ones in control. Paul was simply preaching the gospel and he finds himself in prison. It's humbling to recognize that, the th that there are things that will happen to us that are beyond our control. And how do we respond? Third, this message involves learning. Now, you're all in college and seminary, so you're probably pretty good at learning. But verses 11 and 12 remind us that Paul had to learn this. He says, I learned the secret of being content. Again, to reference Andy Davis in his book, The Power of Christian Contentment. He was, he was here, uh, I believe, last week or the week before. He says that contentment is not part of the original equipment of conversion. He says it's something that must be learned over time. And so he says, imagine a recruit to the U.S. Army standing in line at boot camp, receiving his government-issued provisions as a new soldier, a stack of neatly folded clothing topped off by a new pair of Army boots. Other things will be provided later. You become a believer, contentment isn't in that stack. It has to be learned. You see, Paul's learning, it wasn't instantaneous. It didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen at conversion. It was something that he struggled with. He struggled with over and over and over. And finally, he came to the place where he realized, I've learned the secret of contentment. If you read the book of Acts, you can see Paul's learning time and time again he received persecution trials difficulties acts reveals his learning process you start back in acts 9 he's in damascus immediately after his conversion he preached the word and when the jews plotted to kill him he had to escape the city in jerusalem he spoke boldly and disputed the hellenists and they attempted to kill him in Acts 13, in Antioch and Pisidia, he taught God's word, but the Jews raised up persecution against him and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. Acts 14, in Iconium, a violent attempt was made by both Jews and Gentiles to mistreat and stone them, and so they fled to Lystra. In Lystra, 
Jews from Antioch persuaded the people to stone Paul, and they left him for dead. Acts 16, in Philippi, Paul and Silas were beaten openly and thrown in prison. Acts 17, in Thessalonica, believing Jews stirred up the city, attempted to seize Paul and Silas, who had to escape at night to Berea. In Berea, the unbelieving Jews from Thessalonica stirred up the crowds, forcing the brethren to send Paul away by the sea. Acts 20, in Macedonia, when the Jews plotted against Paul, he changed his travel plans. In Jerusalem, Acts 21, when Paul's seven days of purification were almost complete, the Jews from Asia came to Jerusalem, dragged Paul out of the temple, and began to beat him. Acts 24, in Caesarea, Paul was taken under guard to be judged by the governor Felix. The Jews from Asia stirred up the high priest and the elders in Jerusalem, and they went to Caesarea to testify against him. Acts 27 and 28, you know about his shipwreck in the Mediterranean Sea. And then in Rome, for two years, he's chained to a Roman guard before being released. Contentment is not something that you are born with. It is not something that is granted automatically. It's something that has to be learned, which means that you will need to repeatedly go through difficult times before you master it, and you probably never will. Paul says, I press on. But fourth, this message is Christ exalting. Christ is the one who strengthens us through his strength. Paul says in Ephesians, he reminds us to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. He later writes in 1 Timothy, I thank him who strengthened me, Christ Jesus our Lord. He encourages his protege Timothy, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And while in prison, when everyone else abandoned him, he says, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. And because Christ is the one who strengthens us, this is so important, he receives the glory. You know, one of my favorite verses is 1 Peter 4.11. It says, whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Why? In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. You see, Paul acknowledged that the grace that he received, it was not his own strength. It was the grace of God. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, by the grace of God I am what I am, and by his grace toward me, it was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than all of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. You see, God is more glorified when we are content in trials than when we are content with blessings. And no one has helped us see this more than John Piper in his book, Let the Nations Be Glad. Let me just read a few statements that Piper has given to us. He says, loss and suffering joyfully accepted for the kingdom of God shows the supremacy of God's worth more clearly in all the world than all worship in prayer. He goes on, gratitude for gifts does not prove that the giver is precious. No matter how grateful we are, gold will not make the world think that our God is good. It will make people think that our God is gold. What proves that the giver is precious is the glad-hearted readiness to leave all his, his gifts to be with him. The supremacy of that glory shines most brightly when the satisfaction that we have in him endures in spite of suffering and pain. Now let me take just a few minutes to give you a few examples of how Philippians 4.13 has been significant in my life. The first is with was our final child, number four, Cameron. He was born 17 years ago. And uh, we had a pattern when my wife was pregnant. She would wake me up in the middle of the night and say, we need to go to the hospital. 
And that certainly happened that night. And so we, we got up, we went to the hospital, drove the familiar route. We lived in Penang, Malaysia at the time. And uh, we rushed there, we get there, and uh, the doctor didn't make it on time. But, uh, you know, we thought, we, we knew how this was going. This was our fourth child. We knew how the day would unfold. And, um, but almost immediately after Cameron was born, we, we knew something was, was not right. Uh, instead of cleaning him off and checking his vitals, they rushed him out of the room. And we thought, oh, no, what, that's, not, that's not the way it normally works. Sometime later that day, I was asked to go to the nursery, and I was met by a nurse who informed me that our child had Down syndrome. Upon hearing this news, I, my knees almost buckled. I found it hard to breathe. He, we were told that he had a heart condition as well. And so not long afterwards, I had to go back to the room and, and tell my wife that the, the child that we were anticipating was not the child we got. Now, don't get me wrong. If you know Cameron, he's a, he's a precious kid. But at that moment, when you're not expecting it, it's difficult. All of a sudden, the burdens of his life fell on me at one moment. All his medical issues, all his educational issues. And it crushed me. You see, it's, it's at times like that that Philippians 4.13 matters. God promises to provide strength to us if we are united with him and rely on the strength that he provides. Well, fast forward about nine years, October 2012, my wife found out that she had stage three breast cancer. And I remember being in the, uh, in the room when the doctor came in and he said that he confirmed that the scans in the biopsy indicated that she had cancer. And th this is true story. I became pale and weak and felt like I needed to sit down. I can tell you what, I was glad she was there to comfort me during this hard time. Uh, she was the one that had cancer and, and she's comforting me. Uh, but we were told that she would have to undergo surgery, six months of chemotherapy, another surgery, seven weeks of daily radiation, and then physical therapy. The process took about two years. It was very costly. I could tell you, Philippians 4.13 becomes most relevant, not before a football game or a basketball game, but when you're in the doctor's office and the news is not what you hope for. That's when you need to rely on the strength that God provides, and you're thankful that you have a Savior who supplies it. The most difficult trial in my life, by far, is when we lost our 18 year old son, Brandon. I can tell you that the pain of losing a child is unlike anything you can experience. This is one of the verses that helped me endure and continues to help me because the pain is great even after four and a half years. But God's grace is greater still. In particular, I remember weeping in my living room when I received the news that Brandon was gone, it felt like someone pulled the guts from my body. 
And as I mourned, I, I felt the presence, besides those people who were with me, but I felt the presence as well of, of three bi biblical characters who came to mind and were ministering to me. The first was David, when he got word that his son had died, Absalom. And he cried, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would that I had died instead of you, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. The second was Job, when in faith he confessed, after he had lost everything that the Lord gave, The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And finally, my mind went to Paul in his statement in Philippians 4.13 that I can do all things. I can endure this situation through the strength I receive from Christ. Overcoming difficulties and having the victory is not impossible. The secret is to find our strength and our relationship with Christ. Paul could have become depressed and discouraged, but he relied on the strength that God provides. We too can have the victory through suffering. Victory does not so much have to do with where we are or what we do, but who we are in the midst of of trials. Victory means being content with where God put us. Sometimes we have it good and have an abundance, but sometimes we have it hard and we endure trials and suffering and loss. But regardless of our circumstances, we can have the victory through Christ, through our union with him. The peace and grace that he offers is worth more than anything the world can offer. And so I close with this. In 1860, Charles Spurgeon preached from Philippians 4, and he closed his sermon with these words, and so I close with them as well. He says, before I dismiss you, there is one other thing. You that love not Christ, recollect that you are the most miserable people in the world. Though you may think yourselves happy, there is no one of us who would change places with the best of you. When we are very sick, very poor, on the borders of the grave, if you were to step in and say to us, come, I will change places with you. You shall have my gold, my silver, my riches, my health. There is not one living Christian that would change places with you. We would not stop to deliberate. We would give you at once our answer. No, go your way, delight in what you have, but all your treasures are transient. They will soon pass away. We will keep our sufferings and you shall keep your gaudy toys. Saints have no hell but what they suffer here on earth. Sinners will have no heaven but what they have here in this poor troublesome world. We have our sufferings here and our glory afterwards. You may have your glory here but you will have your sufferings forever and ever. God grant you new hearts and right spirits and a living faith and a living Jesus. Amen.